Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for coming to tonight's lecture. Uh, my name is Michelle Wayne Landold, I'm Deputy Director at the Symmetry Art Foundation. Um, today's lecture, titled Gravity is the Momentum of Feeling, Xin Liu and Joni Zhu in Conversation, which is moderated by Wen Tio, is the second installment of the Asymmetry Distinguished Lecture Series called Energies of Attachment, Rethinking Intimacy in Contemporary Chinese and Sinophone Art. So yeah, there will be two more lectures in this series, as well as an international symposium later on in the year, and you will find all details for the upcoming events on the website of the Quartal Research Forum, um, as well as on Asymmetry's platforms. Um, after the lecture, there will be a small drinks reception, so please do stay on and come say hi. Um, for those who don't know us, we are Asymmetry, a relatively newly established um, independent not-for-profit art foundation that creates and supports professional and academic initiatives in partnership with leading art institutions and universities geared towards practitioners who to any extent identify with greater Chinese and Sinophone culture and heritage. Um, and our collaboration with the Kultur Institute of Art is one of five rolling initiatives that we have. And you're welcome to check out what we do on our website and on our socials. Um, and we also have a newly open space in London Fields, so please also keep an eye out on our public programs. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Dr. Wayne Tio, Senior Lecturer in Modern and Contemporary Art here at the Courtauld Institute of Art, who will start the conversation um, and introduce our speakers, um, Xin and Joni. And with that, I hand over to you, Wayne. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, it is so, thank you all for coming as well. It's a great pleasure to be able to introduce our two speakers today. And um, when we were convening um, this lecture series, which, as Michelle mentioned, explores various modalities of intimacy in uh, Chinese and Sinophone art, uh, Xin was actually one of the first artists who came to my mind. Um, her transdisciplinary work as we shall soon see, pushes the boundaries of art, science, uh, biotechnology, astrobiology, AI, and robotics, but is always grounded in a searching exploration of the things that make us human. Uh, Xin was born in Xinjiang in the People's Republic of China and studied mechanical engineering at Tsinghua University before pursuing an MFA at Rhode Island School of Design. She is currently arts curator in the MIT Media Lab Space uh, Space Exploration Initiative and is an alumna of MIT Media Lab's Fluid Interfaces Group. Uh, Sin is also artist in residence at SETI Institute, a research organization <coughs> devoted to the study of life in the universe, um, astrobiology, and space science. So Sin is the recipient of numerous awards, too many to recount here, uh, but they include uh, Porsche's Chinese Young Artist of the Year, the Ex Museum Triennial Award, uh, Sundance New Fron Frontier Award, and many others. And she's recently moved uh, to the UK, which we're very excited about. Um, and she will be joined in conversation today by uh, Dr. Joni Tu, uh, a curator who works at the intersection of contemporary art, critical theory, and cultural analysis. Uh, Joni is a lecturer at the School of Creative Arts at the University of Hertfordshire and has previously lectured at Goldsmiths, where she received her PhD in curatorial knowledge um, and completed a postdoc there as well, investigating networked surveillance, visual arts, and minoritarian politics. Uh, she's also held positions at Sadie Cole's HQ and King's Place and organized numerous projects. Um, so please join me in welcoming them today. <laughs> so as, as a way into the conversation, uh, we, will still, we will first play uh, Sin's 10 minute film, Living Distance, um, followed by a conversation between uh, Joni and Sin. Um, and then there'll be a bit of time for questions uh, from you after that, uh, followed by a drinks reception, uh, which is going to be just down the hallway. So, without further ado, we are going to begin with film. That was fantastic. So, thank you. Yes. <laughs> I'll hand over to you, Joni. Um, can you guys can you guys hear us? Okay. In the yes. Back. Okay. I wanted to begin with the idea of journey. So, um, in the film that we see, um, kind of narrates through the fragmentary ideas of womanhood. 
in relation to the different organ that you were naming or tooth. The layers of cultural memory also were revealing with your grandmother, as well as um, the kind of intimate moment that you were sharing, the moment that you're in the shower, the thing that's the lecture series, intimacy. Um, so all of that leading us to the moment where the tooth is being put in the machine that you build and launch into the space. And um, I'm curious to know the journey of the tooth, how you envisioned the journey of the tooth to begin with, as well as your own journey and the geographical journey from Xinjiang to Beijing, Beijing to the US and the US to UK, as well as um, your, your journey in relation to, to the fields, the disciplinary fields, um, from engineering to now um, techno-science in the crossroad with art. Yeah. That's a very big question. <laughs> Can you summarize your life? <laughs> um, just starting with the project itself, yeah. um, I don't know if you guys have watched this animation called um, New Genesis Evangelion. Yes. I think when I started thinking of Living Distance as a project, it was basically a fine art for that animation from me because um, I was very obsessed with the idea of that transhumanism but also like teenagers riding robots but in the end deciding the fate of humanities by deciding whether people can eventually understand each other or not and it just really um, struck me that how many times the director of that <coughs> animation himself rewrote the final ending for the series, I don't know, numerous times. I don't even remember, maybe five or six times. Um, and I think somehow this journey of the twos was very much uh, related to what I was thinking when I was a teenager and thinking about that idea of like trying to be understand and trying to make connections but then there is this lineage that you treasure is also something haunts you it's, it's very painful to be kind of hate your mother but also love your mother at the same time um, and I think that goes back to what goes forward with the question that about journey that I grew up in Xinjiang and then I actually left home in 15 when I was 15 um, went to a boarding school in a slightly bigger city uh, a bit further like four hours drive from my hometown um, but the reason I went there was because the school was better so I had a better chance to go to even better school um, but that also partially was like my teenager self was like, I don't want to live here anymore. Mm. And I was having a lot of like fights with my mom. Um, but then kind of set me in this endless like expedition. It's like, you know, the shooting arrow, just leave and leave and leave and leave. And I think lots of people here probably have that experience very much shared in the diaspora. Um, so it was very interesting because when I was doing the film, I wasn't thinking much about it. But after the film is finished, I showed it with a friend who I actually didn't know her that well. But after she watched it, uh, she told me that she saw that I had a very strong homesickness in the film. Mm. And in that I think was something I had a hard time to deal with mm -hmm. at the moment to think about what it means I mean um, so I don't know um, nowadays looking at that film I felt like it was very much about someone who was a daughter yeah yeah I think I am thinking about that more or differently nowadays as I am thinking about whether to become mother one day. Uh, well, 
we can talk about that in the later part of the conversation. Yeah. So but, in a way, yeah. the tooth is kind of following like a, a, sen a sensual kind of machinic line that is a tooth embedded in the whole crystallization of your being that is being sent to the outer space. Yeah, because I was thinking about the, the robot or this creature or avatar, whatever you call it, and I was thinking, for me, it has to be a mechanical system. Mm -hmm. And I was imagining, you know, you see the glass that is like the skin, and I want to make it organic on the shell, and I want to, uh, to have this aluminum structures like the bone, and I was imagining the electronics, the computers, like the brain and the bloodstream. I just felt like it has to have like <coughs> something organic like you can call it a soul, but I also don't like it to be something so um, soft or ephemeral, like hair or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I happened to actually had my wisdom tooth extracted a year before, and I had the tooth, and that's the only part that I felt like, oh my God, it's just perfect. Right. Uh, in terms of the material itself and what it means, etc. So that kind of like end up being a, a natural decision. Calling the devil, um, but I was asked by quite a few people that whether I, I put my teeth out for this film. I, mm. I didn't. <laughs> I've been really cool, but I didn't. Right. Um, that leads to me to think the way you think around the tooth, sending the tooth to the space, is kind of like a mechanical engineering way of sending yeah. it. But your expression um, is more kind of performative expression. And that is manifested in a lot of your other works, that performativity is in either film, in the engineer, the sculpture, as well as later on in bordery as well. Um, talk us through it about the kind of elements of performativity and how do you use that as, as a way of expressing through all of the different kind of fields you're trying to, to work together, to bring together. Sometimes I tried to answer that question by just saying that I used to dance, that's why. But I think that's a lazy answer, honestly. Mm. The truth, if I really think about it, partially is like when I set up to do projects, I often tell my, myself a story. And if there's a story, there's always a protagonist mm. or like a sequence of events. And there's performer or actor, whatever you call it. It's time-based, no matter it's in the actual creation of the work or the final medium of the work. So that kind of performativity is perhaps now thinking about it coming from the storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, then the protagonist is performing. Mm -hmm. But it's also semi like real mm -hmm. because it's always real events. Mm -hmm. I was performing but I was also actually doing it. So mm -hmm. there's elements of documentary mm -hmm. and performance mm -hmm. like combined together. Um, it was just end up being um, the style because that's how I started working on those projects and it's so long and so big. So I cannot help but just to start documenting the right. process. And do you see that the performativity, the way you choreograph um, your performances or with other performers that you work with as well, are along the similar similar lines to, to engineering, to, to the kind of mechanical side of things, like choreography and engineering? I wish so, because uh, I would be much better at it if I could approach it similarly and much better a mechanical engineer than a performer, I would say. Um, I think on the performance side of things, it was very intuitive. It was often a situation that I set up to be quite extreme, then the body reacts to it, mm -hmm. rather than, okay, this is like the, the dance choreography, let's make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, so the footage you saw there, the underwater part, it was just, 
underwater, and I couldn't help my breath that much. So you can see the footage is cut very short because mm. after a while I just have to like get some air. Um, and then whatever the movements I was doing, just as much as I can imagine um, with my body, uh, with my capacity. Um, and the part in the desert was also very intuitive. It's kind of funny because I was in Texas and as part of the project that we were using gunpowder for mm -hmm. uh, a device shooting. It did not succeed, so you did not see that in the film. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, I had to buy some gunpowder mm -hmm. and it was shipped to a location in Texas. But I cannot just bring it back to where I was living then back into Boston on an airplane. So I have this big jar of gunpowder. I just don't know what to do with it. Um, and I cannot just leave it somewhere, it's very dangerous. So that's why I came up with the idea of be like, okay, let's just do something mm -hmm. in the desert. Um, so that's kind of what initiated uh, the performance. Well, it's very interesting that you just said um, it's you build so much machine, right? You build so many things, and the kind of engagement with the machine, you build a tooth machine to be plugged into a flying machine. But then on the other side, a lot of your practice is on the intuitive um, kind of understanding of being. And intuitivity is precisely something that the machine doesn't have. And I think that's very interesting. But the kind of collaboration between within yourself, the intuitivity and the machinic kind of way of working, and also your collaboration with other labs, other researchers, other scientists, um, can you kind of reveal a little bit about that process as well? Uh, how do you come about all of these projects that is really engaging in a different field? Yeah, um, partially because I did was studying in a different domain, so I, I made friends. I think that's what everything how it happens, right? Um, and I I am a nerd. In the end, that I talk with my friends quite a bit about things they're doing. So I got excited. So f for this image, just for now, for example, I was doing zero G flights again because I was working in this field, but then. I was just thinking, I'm not going to just fly for no reason, so I called up a fashion designer friend to think about some ideas, and I was thinking about something can float, looking better. So lots of times, it's like an opportunity came up, and then I start thinking about what I'm interested in right now, and I reach out to people right away, and I really try to um, kind of make it interesting for everybody. And this is another project with a bunch of biologists about plastic eating bacteria in International Space Station. So that was also a kind of project that I felt like really very much stay in the design or like engineering, very applied. Sometimes I even feel guilty to do it because like I get criticized very early on in my career when I show slides like that in an art context. People be like, that's not art. Mm. And I'm like, okay, I'm so sorry. So, uh, <laughs> so sometimes I feel like I have to hide and do like science, like secret. Um, but I like it because it tells me so much about new way of thinking. Um, that particular project, we, I learned a lot about like laboratory revolution, how to drive certain kind of microorganism to like evolve in a direction in what you want it to. And there's so much ethical issues around that, but then working on it gave me a very intimate reaction to the topic. Mm -hmm. um, but then the goal in the end is to publish a paper in Nature, is mm -hmm. not to like make a sculpture. So. Of course, the biologist would be interested, um, but then how then I can make it back to the art world mm. is a question sometimes I just, well, maybe don't need to. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the projects, like the one, mm, like the living distance, it really started as, um, um, as 
a proposal that I give to the school saying that I want to build a robot right. that can navigate in with business in um, this new way by shooting threads and drag itself around like a spider, mm -hmm. Spider-Man. Um, and they were like, okay, great. So I wrote a proposal to MIT um, Mobility. Um, then once the mechanism is accepted, and they were like, well, then you don't care about what's a passenger, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's why I sneak in my tools and all the other elements into it. So I always try to see that what are people's core interests are, and then trying to make sure that's satisfied, mm -hmm. and I can have my own agenda. Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of fun sometimes, feel like a lot of like sneaking around, um, but then also make the story much more interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of um, standing out for me just now is um, you mentioned organism um, and then you mentioned tools. Um, you work a lot with organism and for instance with living distance it's an organism that the tooth is outside of your body and then you project it into an outer space through a machine. They're kind of producing a certain lifespan for an organism again. And also thinking about there is a previous project that you did um, was with the potato, that potato being able to reproduce itself again in outer space, that kind of interesting relationship between machine and its reproducibility and organism and its reproducibility and your desire of wanting to do these projects um, to kind of ask favor for people and, and make them happen. Tell, tell, tell us a little bit more about this desire. Well, maybe first I think it's a good idea to tell us a bit about the potato project because that's yeah. completely fascinating and involves... It's, yeah, it's not in the slides. Um, it's, it's this potatoes seeds, it's called True Potato Seeds, that I, it's so funny, speaking of collaborators, I worked with um, a Peruvian artist, Lucia Moog, we've been collaborating on this project for several years, but we also got a partnership, a collaboration relationship with International Potato Center. Yeah. And this was for, and this was, and this was a project that was going to go to the International Space it Station. Did. Right? Uh, so it was on ISS for a month during the March of 2020. So it was uh, very intense, as you can imagine. I, I uh, integrated the payload, and then COVID happened. Um, but the whole project was actually about biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And I was very interested in kind of the narrative of crops, in um, the narrative of human um, migration or immigration. As you think about potatoes, they are the kind of one of the top five largest growing crops around the world and every culture and country has some kind of home local potato dishes. Right. Uh, but they are native to Peru. So the journey of potatoes spreading across the world is kind of mirroring the human colonizing kind of history. Right. But at the same time, there is a, something I found quite, I won't say beautiful, but more, more touching than just colonization is that once potato arrived in lots of places, they become part of the diet. People start cooking with them. You have a grandma dish that is using this new plant that in turn nurtured the new generations that mm -hmm. are having their gut biome probably in some way mixed from all kinds of culture. Um, and I got inspired for this project actually because I was living in Brooklyn and there was this restaurant they cook training Italian Chinese food. And I was like, what is that? Um, and then that's very exciting in a way, a kind of another conversation about digesting and sharing dishes and sharing stories. And I have learned how to eat salads thanks to my partner, uh, 
finally, five years later, because at the beginning I was very much protesting about eating grass. Um, so I think that is something I really felt as an immigrant, um, thinking about. Uh, so this potato is also really fun because we were able to get the seeds back from the International Space Station and growing them, and we are actually giving them to like public schools in the state, and then we're also giving it to other artists. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you say so, it's like colonizing, but also sharing. We're like giving those space potatoes and asking them to do whatever they want with it, to use a potato as protagonist mm -hmm. in their story, to ask about this new journey for potatoes that potentially will be used for the next human destination. Mm -hmm. If you watch Martian, I think that's the movie. The guy, he was like trapped on Mars himself or something. Mm -hmm. I think he was like growing potatoes mm -hmm. to survive with his poop, poop mm -hmm. something like that. And I was like really fascinated. It's like, oh my God, even going to Mars, we're going to grow potatoes. Mm -hmm. So um, there's something quite nice about talking about <clears throat> space explorations and technologies, but with a note of such a daily staple food, yeah. and I think everyone started to have an opinion. Mm -hmm. So I, I just like that interactivity yeah. of, of this story of potatoes. Yeah. And I think the potato being going to the space and coming back as seeds and replanted in the earth is a way of thinking, you know, I don't know if you have seen this series called The Silent Sea, where the human gone onto the moon to extract the lunar water. A lot of the things that kind of is sci-fi um, influenced or it's, it's about technology, it's about extraction. We go to a place, we extract those things back. Whereas with the potato, is that you send the potato out and then you bring the potato back and you plant it in the earth. And um, it's kind of makes me think of the earth is this body without the organs and then, then you bring this flow of the organs onto the earth again to kind of build another world thinking about um, intimacy, building world. And, um, and you seem to engage with elements within the body quite a bit and, and thinking about womanhood that you just said and DNAs and stuff and then the book that you made out of the, the sequence of your X chromosome with the DNA. Um, you manage to kind of build a new world with these organs that is in a form that is different, thing, that is outside of your body. Um, tell us a little bit more about this um, working with the body, working with DNA, but seeing it from outside of your own body. When I first worked on the DNA project, is this the slide that I think we're going to fly over. Sorry, guys. Um, oh, maybe we can talk about white stone for a second too. These are actual rocket debris. Um, this is such a fun journey back home. Um, yeah, so these are the books. Um, so I extracted um, my DNA in collaboration with a scientist friend from Columbia University. So what happened is that I did 23andMe for fun when I was like very young, when it just came out. You know, I was a nerd, I was just curious about all of it. But then later, through the years, I getting these emails from them constantly telling me they had a new discovery <laughs> about, I have, I don't know, dry earwax or wet earwax or like you know like all the things and just like surprise we know something again about you um and it's just like getting this weird emails all the time and that start make me feel like being seen through this kind of massive data that containing my body but i could never get access to it mm. Um, so I just decided to like work with my friend um, and printed an entire chromosome out 
it was thousands of pages, and I would use a little, like tiny, tiny font, mm -hmm. and I would just want to have this sense of control of how much it is, and somehow the folding, making a accordion book, was giving me this textile feelings that I'm touching it. Mm -hmm. um, but then later, I still don't understand anything. Mm -hmm. So recently, in the past year, I've been working on a new series of this kind of panels that I'm just looking at the DNAs as they are in A, T, C, G, and little mm -hmm. tiny words. And I start drawing them. Um, well, I'm not a painter, as you can tell. So this is like my again like almost a guilty pleasure and I was like I'm gonna just make things um, and it becomes a weird like process that I reacting to this pages individually very intuitively and then once I made them I felt like they're really like them some kind of like tarot cards or like fortune telling um, panels that I collected based on my actual DNA book because they are all about me. If one day I can read, I will know something again about myself. So I was very interested in that tension about this destiny of who you will be yeah. um, and this potential mobility that you could carve for yourself to become who you can be. At the same time, you know, like recently, I don't know how to like pause it, <laughs> um, but I've been thinking about quite about the the idea of DNA because you know in living distance I was like a daughter. It felt real like you know you have this like forever energy you can just keep going to farther away, you know, explore the world. It's very it's a very Chinese, very American. Mm -hmm. um, and now as I'm thinking more about like one day I'm gonna become a mother or not, and I start thinking the necessary of like me giving birth mm. or like can I just adopt a kid? Mm. And this I don't know, like everyone's so sure about that biological connection one will for sure have by passing through its genetic information. Yeah. And it's like really, um, you know, it freaks me out a little bit. Yeah. Because, um, you know, in a way, I perceive myself as a very liberal person. I should have the ability to love any children. Yeah. But I'm like, no, I'm not going to give them my own. Yeah. I'm gonna make one like with half of my data load, yeah. and it's like, and it's just like having this weird like um, contradicting thoughts about it. Um, so I've been like draining in my own DNA for, for quite a while, uh, for the past year, and I've been. I mean, we talk about it. A new thing I've been working on for the new exhibitions is actually about. Um, um, cryogenics, the technology that frees people and melts them um, in order to preserve the lifespan um, of individuals. And it's often used in narratives of science fiction. Mm -hmm. And I'm, of course, fascinated by it, but I felt it's like weirdly, um, or is obviously really uh, arrogant as someone wants to just like live so long and maintain their own self rather than having like a metabolic processes. Yeah. And the people who have done it in real life, the immortalists, there's a group, often people from the, the West Coast, like very much materialistic technology, optimism, culture, but at the same time they are often treated as living new age by the real scientists, mm -hmm. um, but then they also be criticized by the actual spiritual community because they are like trying to achieve immortality. So there's most of the conversation about it is in that context, 
But for me, the reason I start thinking so much more about it is that I want to freeze my eggs.、Um, since last year, I wanted to, and I just like this is it. This is cryogenics,、uh, but in a in a different、um, system. Yeah. About preserving the productivity of women. Yeah. And <coughs> I just start to kind of making connections in that way. I'm thinking about controls. And the, the idea of productivity, and how that dominates time and the bodies, and how we kind of, you know, thinking about time is not useful. Time is not worth passing or living through if you're not making. So better freeze it up, and it's just like also fix me out a little bit. Yeah,、uh, I keep thinking about、um, our theme for the whole lecture. Serious intimacy, um, Bella's、um, kind of way of engaging intimacy, as she says that the the desiring for a normative life is is inconvenient for the neoliberal kind of way of reproducing the society, and I think precisely that's the pressure that we all have as women right now at this moment in our life. You know, do we keep on producing in in a normative way? So that the society can be pushed forward, or do we desire other forms like the way that you desired to engage with your DNA to give potentialities to your DNA and organism in other ways? And I think maybe that's a good note. It's a kind of full circle because you started with living distance as a daughter. Now you're thinking about, you know, yeah, yeah, adopting mom. Yeah, <laughs> and we should open to the floor. I think yeah, I think that you've you've, you've raised. So many interesting ideas and you know, concepts. One of the most amazing things about your practice, I think, is how you know your your kind of um, um, your practice always deals with the spaces you know, above us, within us, and also between us in many in you know, really fascinating ways. But also,、um, one of the things that you both share, I think, in both your research is,、uh, for instance, a preoccupation with some of the. Less,、uh, you know, sort of questions of surveillance, for instance, and much of your work deals with these concepts of the extraterrestrial gaze,、uh, you know, satellites and so on. And、um, you mentioned different forms of control, and you know that's something that you look at a lot in your research as well, Jim.、Um, and I think you've had、uh, several conversations about this idea of what、uh, surveillance might mean in the context of technology. Do you want to talk a little bit more about? About that before we open to audience questions.、Mm. I think thinking that in relation to to again going back to intimacy is that the boundaries today of surveillance isn't so obvious anymore. It's permeated everywhere, and、um, in our pre- we we previously talked about、um, what intimacy meant for each one of us, and I really thought intimacy is about breaking down the boundaries. The boundaries between human and non-human, the boundaries between culture and nature, and, and because those dissolving of boundaries, therefore we can achieve intimacy. But precisely on the other hand, we're thinking about surveillance. It's those boundaries, those physical boundaries, doesn't exist anymore. Or an encroaching. Exactly. So they pe-、yeah. they permeate in our everyday life in that sense. And, yeah. Yeah, Lisa, I really loved that satellite project that you did. Actually, that was really interesting. I think in the light of you know, sort of more recent、uh, paranoid news events as well,、um, the Chinese bloom. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>、um, and I think there's an interesting proximity、uh, in your practice with these sort of、uh, geopolitical anxieties, perhaps.、Um, mm. And part of what you do, which I find so interesting, is that you're both rendering technology、uh, something. Uh, you're kind of working with such expansive and boundless ideas,、um, but always relating it to something intimate and human in a lot of ways, whether it's to your own body and to, <clears throat> you know, what、um, Joni mentioned, this idea of kind of different choreographies and collaborations of practice,、um, and uh, at the same time also、um, also pushing the boundaries, in fact, towards slightly more uncomfortable or anxious realities、um, as well. Um, for the satellite project you mentioned, and yeah, it's because this is a conversation, so we didn't, I didn't like present as like an artist talk, and assumed that there might be some pre,、um, 
familiarity with my work already. Um, but the satellite work uh, when you just mentioned is a series of I think also like a performance almost or um, that I was chasing satellites both myself and using um, a DIY antenna. Uh, at the beginning, the first antenna made was made out of a broom, broomstick by Muji. They had there like this is some mobile um, and then some copper wire because I was trapped in my apartment in Brooklyn and I really felt like some kind of anxiety that you know this contradicting feeling that you are in this global pandemic but at the same time the best thing for you to do is to, to to quarantine mm. and that and you're reading everything everywhere at the same time it's very like stretching in, in my um, mental space that I was very um, much hoping to make any kind of connection mm. so I just got excited and then on some online random nerd reddit um, read about satellite chasing. So essentially these are satellites that are retired for about 20 years but as you can imagine the satellites back then in the 90s they were not, they were decommissioned but they were still kind of captured in their technological time in the 90s. No one shut them down so as like as long as the solar panel is powering them they're doing their old jobs. Mm -hmm. So they're just like taking pictures, they're weather satellites, so they're taking pictures of the Earth and broadcasting it. Um, back then, those broadcasted information are very much uh, encrypted, but now it's basically um, uh, public knowledge, and NASA even released a white book about how to receive it mm -hmm. as like an amateur radio project. So, so, so the chasing satellite was made before the white storm, and why stone is then you you actually want to chase the the, the, the rocket? Okay, yeah. So, so for the satellites, I just decided to chase the satellites by you know climbing up the roof and listen to this really remote sound from this very much abandoned satellites. And I felt like a, a weird extraterrestrial date with those objects uh, in those days because you know they have like predicted passing time, I climb up to the roof mm -hmm. and holding my antenna just wait for it. In the COVID time, I have no other plans. Um, and then I start seeing those images and then that's when I got interested in the idea of how those images are taken. Mm -hmm. This whole history of orbital photography in the way if you imagine you know, the Earth as a blue marble, it is very much an image that is not a, through the human eye, mm. but a machine eye, uh, unless you're like one of the astronauts in Apollo. Um, so that became kind of a narrative about what to be seen as and how to be understood as in that narrative, because the only way you know you're living on this planet is by those images, but then it's this weird distance created by the observers and the observed. So I created a whole series around that work. Um, but I think in some way, I found those satellites, particularly the ones I worked with, quite interestingly, interestingly the opposite of the surveillance, because I was able to talk to them directly. There's something very uh, liberating about it, and it's um, not a Google map of information that being, you know, transmitted and filtered and edited by different systems until the moment it arrived in my phone. It was a direct contact um, with something that has been quietly orbiting the Earth shouting back to the earth uh, with no one listening for 20 years and I felt like it's, it's very much like a character mm -hmm. uh, that I'm having a conversation with rather than a let's say, dead mm -hmm. object. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so later on I also did another project about chasing 
rocket degrees, but we don't have to go through that. Yeah. Well, on the note of communication, perhaps you might open up to some questions from the audience.